All right, my friends, let's start because I think today is one of those opportunities. Like, you know, you have a busy work week, right? And you look forward to certain meetings and you dread other meetings. I've been looking forward to this conversation for weeks and not to put my panelists in the spot, but we've got three phenomenal rising leaders in LGBTQ community that I just am so excited to hear from. Let me set the stage a bit and set some context around why we're all here, what the heck we're all doing here and who I am. So please use that chat to hit some questions. Let us know what you think. We are here for uh, your interaction as well. You should all be able to see my screen right now. My name is Katie Martell. I'm on the board of Pride in Our Workplace, which is a nonprofit that really seeks to address the workplace experience for LGBTQ plus individuals. Um, it's a nonprofit that's been around a while and shout out to John and Matt if he's on um, and all the people that are involved is a completely volunteer led organization. Shout out to Carly behind the scenes who put all of this together. And if everything goes wrong, it's her fault. Just kidding. Uh, but it's really an opportunity for uh, like minded professionals to come together in a nonprofit setting to amplify the experience of um, folks in the workplace navigating things. If you're on the call right now, you're somebody who's probably really invested in ensuring that your workplace is one that is fair, equitable, safe, inclusive, all of the above. Or maybe you're somebody in the community that wants to hear others have the same experience like you. Either way, welcome. Um, and if you haven't heard about PIOW, I hope you check us out. Uh, we amplify perspectives like what you're going to hear today. We gather best practices. Um, and most importantly, we really bring people together to help navigate the changing world around equality and DEI and all the things that we know we have to address in addition to our day jobs. What we do is made possible by our sponsors. They also offer, uh, enjoy a range of benefits. So if you would like to be a sponsor, um, you would enjoy access to kind of private, if you have an ERG, private ERG to ERG um, events, you can see a number of them on screen here. And I wanna thank them for being able to support what Pride in Our Workplace does. We're so happy to have your support. And what you do means that we can actually broaden our community impact. We have a community grant program that recognizes smaller nonprofits. It really is a, a full-fledged organization. Check us out. Thank you to our sponsors. Today, however, what we want to dig in on is really what the next generation, I know I hate calling it, I'm an elder millennial myself, right? And a lot of our panelists are in, I guess, Gen Z, question mark, who knows? The point is we're all moving through this. Jace is like, I don't know where I sit, but listen, I'm here. We're all here as young professionals in the workplace, and we're asking a really loaded question, but it's one that I hope you find is filled with optimism because we're looking to the future. What do leaders, uh, rising leaders, the leaders of tomorrow need in the workplace to thrive? That's the question I want to focus us on today. We're going to talk about boundaries. We're going to talk about authenticity, allyship. We'll talk about the generational shifts as we approach what we need to do with DEI, uh, workplace culture, and of course, our public reputation. We have an amazing set of participants today, and I want to tell you about them, and I want them to introduce themselves, but first and foremost, let me just give a big thanks. Each of them have important day jobs that you're going to hear about, and they've taken time out of them to be here. So thank you all, and if you're missing an important meeting, again, blame Carly. It is all her fault, um, but let me just open it up to my panelists to um, introduce yourselves and hear a little bit about your career to date and what you do day-to-day, uh, -day. and Andrew, I'm going to ask you to unmute and put you right on the spot because your name starts with A. There's nothing personal here. Andrew, welcome to the broadcast. Um, please join us. Tell us all about yourself and what you're up to at Lock Lord. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Andrew Trong. I am now an associate at Lock Lord, uh, thankfully uh, past the bar. <laughs> um, so I, uh, as I just mentioned, am now in legal fields about just over a month in now here at a large firm. Um, Lock Lord is a large law firm. Previously, I, you know, after college, I worked as a paralegal in a smaller law firm and then went to law school. So a pretty um, directed track, I'd say, um, and I've had, I guess, differing experiences with, um, you know, my queerness in the workspaces. And I'm excited to dive into that with the panelists today. We're happy you're here. We look forward to hearing those experiences and congrats on passing the bar. My goodness, that's just a round of applause for you today. Um, and shout out to Lock Lord, who is a really important supporter of PIOW. And hi, Matt, if you're on the call today, we love Andrew and thank you for introducing us. Okay, Jace, my friend, welcome to the broadcast. Tell us everything about yourself uh, and what you're up to today. Hello, good morning, everyone. My name is Jason, I use they, them pronouns. Uh, so on here, you'll see I'm a communications coordinator for the Council of Go for Global Equality. Uh, advocacy nonprofit that pushes uh, policy at the DC level uh, for federal um, federal politics uh, on LGBTQ equality issues globally. 
but as my picture alludes to, I'm also wearing a, another hat, that of a national park ranger. Um, so I am between seasons, not officially in that role right now, uh, but that is a unique dimension of the life that I now lead post uh, COVID hitting our world and, and kind of changing my priorities. Previously, I worked a lot in events and event logistics, both in a political space and at organizations like the Boston Globe. Uh, so I'm really glad to be joining with all that wealth of perspective, having advocated for uh, queer people uh, in those spaces across the board. So thanks so much, Katie and, and Carly, for having me join today. We're so happy to have you. Can't wait to hear more about that those, that, that range of experience. And the hat is just stunning. I just, I'd like, can you buy <laughs> just the hat? Can you just buy the hat and wear it? Cause I'd like it, please. No, You're like, no, you have to wear it. Oh, all right. I will I know. see if they accept my, my you, know, you look great. <laughs> thank you for being here. Um, Gabrielle, my love, thank you for being here as well. And again, I just want to thank all of our panelists. Y'all have real day jobs. Thank you for taking time out. Gabrielle, tell us what that day job entails for you because I think it's fascinating. Thank you so much. So I'm, first of all, I'm thrilled to be here. My name is Gabrielle Ulibay. I use she, her pronouns. I'm currently an e-commerce writer at Marie Claire magazine. So that means I write about um, just about anything that you can buy and then some. So I write about fashion, beauty. Um, I write about like tech, home, and I uh, run our sexual wellness section at Marie Claire as well, which is just like a great way to um, entice people with products and then teach them a little something about sex ed and content, uh, cons content consent, <laughs> um, so that everyone can be content and just inclusivity. Um, previously, I've also worked in a couple of different fields. So I used to work for the office of the mayor of Boston. Um, I used to manage um, study abroad programs at Northeastern. And then I worked in sales at Drizzly, the alcohol delivery company. So I've done, I've worn a couple of different hats. I'll say, I mean, and not any physical hats like Jace has here on this picture, but really you all should right. look up Gabrielle's right. writing. Please Google her right now. There are oodles and oodles of articles uh, for years now that I just, I, I got to dig into after I was introduced to Gabrielle. And honestly, writing is poignant, it's funny and it's necessary. So we're happy to have you here. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm just gonna take off these slides real quick and just have this conversation focus on our lovely panelists. So take this opportunity to screenshot it if you would like to make sure you Google them after. Okay, so it's just us, my friends. We're here now for the conversation. Um, like I said, attendees, my, my esteemed delegates, if you have questions for the panelists as you go, put them right in the chat or the Q&A, and I will monitor throughout. So don't let this just be uh, me asking questions. Um, but I want to I want to kind of orient us around what we're here to talk about today. We are um, coming off of uh, an exciting kind of day of voting and still kind of waiting for the results. But I have to say we've had some exciting wins. I want to just point out here in Mass, Maura Healy, our first openly gay, first woman elected governor of Massachusetts. I have a t-shirt that says, my governor is a baller. <laughs> She's a point at, at Harvard. Um, we have the first Gen Z House member, first Black governor of Maryland, many others. Today, we're kind of centering this conversation about how the workplace can either echo or fight against what we're seeing in the political landscape, right? We can't ignore what's happening in politics around division and marginalization and some of the really harmful narratives we're seeing. So the workplace that we all operate in, and you've seen three very different perspectives with our panel, Every single workplace is a part of the community in which it does business, right? It's where we spend the majority of our working hours, our waking hours, jobs account for our livelihood, our financial security, work and our identities and the political landscape is all part of the same story. So the context of this conversation could not be more important, more poignant. And I want to ask my first question to the panelists. Um, and Andrew, I'm going to put you on the spot again to please take us into it. But as we work and move through the workplace, I want to ask about how you balance identity, all of the ways that identity shows up, and what that tension might be in conforming to an existing office culture, or as you are just starting in your career, the future of that office culture. And Andrew, tell, tell us about how you, you would address this, this point of view. Yeah, I think that's, um, I mean, as a queer person in one way, that's a question. And also as an Asian uh, person, a person of color, that, that manifests itself in a different way. Um, as well. And I think it's it's been those have been questions that I've had to think about leading up to my career in the law, which, as I mentioned earlier, was something I'd always kind of been on the track of. So it's, it's been weighing on me um, for a while. And I think that law, uh, unsurprisingly, is a more conservative um, industry in general. So that's something that kind of colored how I viewed, like, how am I going to have to act in these spaces? Who like, how do I present? Can I be authentic while also 
um, you know, not making the best impression I can in a conservative space. Uh, I have found, luckily, in, in my current workplace, um, mentors and colleagues that have been very supportive, both within the LGBTQ community and outside. And that has really helped me, I think, be more brave and show up more authentically and um, be in, in this space even now, right now. I know that uh, others in the office were emailing me, letting me know like, oh, good luck, I'll be listening in today, um, which is something I never could have imagined uh, growing up and entering into this space. Uh, so I think, you know, I know we're talking about mentors later, but I think mentors, colleagues in the individual environment, even if it's in a more conservative, stuffy industry, can make a huge difference in terms of um, being confident and comfortable being more authentic in who I am in the workplace. Right. And and again, shout out Lock Lord. Thank you. Because I think this is the big question a lot of employers face is how do we best support all of our employees? Um, can I ask you to speak to what uh, kind of additional work is placed on um, individuals that that are out at work? Uh, I know that it's often called shadow work, right? In addition to the work that you do at, at, in your in your day job, which is really hard. I love lawyers, but I don't want your job. Tell us about that additional layer, please. Yeah, and I think this is this is um, you know across every industry for I think so many people, it's not the work that we are assigned to do as uh, you know our job descriptions are. It's interacting in a space where we are not highly represented, um, where we are seen as uh, when we're not the norm, right? You know, we're we. <laughs> We have identities and experiences as queer people, um, as people of color, as you know, gender minorities, and people have questions, and sometimes they expect us to educate, uh, but that takes time, that takes energy, that takes uh, a lot of a lot out of uh, people at times when we may not have that to give, um, and that is just kind of I think an additional layer of how we have to show up in the workplace. We perform our regular jobs, but then we always are kind of, for me at least, I feel at the ready to kind of take on some of that additional work. Is this now an education moment? Is this now um, a moment where I have to kind of think about what else I have to say or share, uh, considering just the fact that we're in spaces that um, people don't know that much sometimes about our experiences. And you feel the 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 need to educate or to put yourself out there. And let's let's acknowledge the inherent risk in doing that, right? The vulnerability in doing that. But again, it's under the guise of moving what is essentially a, an entire community forward. It's a lot of pressure on an individual. Again, we give you a lot of, of kudos for that. But also, um, you mentioned mentors and allies, and I do want to cover them later. Um, but it is it is part of this. We have to be kind of you know united in that effort. Um, so thank you, Andrew, for sharing that that point of view, and and you know uh, we appreciate that. And Gabrielle, I know you've had similar type experiences in the content creation space, in the media space, having a platform, having an actual opportunity to change minds, but having to work with some internal um, stakeholders who, honestly, colleagues that have to navigate your own identity and your own desire to change some of these narratives. Tell us about your experiences. Yeah, so I've had them um, across both. I work in media now, obviously, and also when I used to work in um, government and in higher education, it's often been um, a bit of a quandary to like disclose my sexuality when I talk to people because I think people look at them presenting um, like women and they assume that you're straight. And if you tell, in my experience, when I tell somebody that I'm bisexual, it's often perceived as an inherently sexy or naughty disclosure. And people think that they then have permission to ask about your like sexual experiences. They think they have permission to ask things like, like, are you more gay? Are you more straight? Like, are you just fun? Um, or you see this in the workplace often. I think people in the past like five years, I'd say, have copped on to the fact that like you can't ask that that's super inappropriate but you'll see what i would say is like an internal eyebrow raise and um I, like there's not I, I don't know how to describe it but i see like jace nodding and so i feel like, like you see like people just kind of like there's this really like minute smirk and i think that people in the lgbt community 
really um, know how to identify that smirk. And like, if you think that we can't see it, we 110% can, because we've lived basically our whole lives, like attuning ourselves to these really, really like micro, micro aggressions. So um, there have been times, I think that, I guess to like cap off, um, I think that there have been times where like women in general, we're already very nervous about constantly being patronized and not taking, not being taken seriously in the workplace just by like existing and walking about, then to like add another layer to that by telling someone your sexuality and then, or just being open and it comes up and you're cool with it coming up, like um, to be, have this fear of being patronized on another level, I guess makes me feel, it makes me and I know a lot of other people who are, who are bi or who are just LGBTQ in general, makes us feel like we like, are, you never really have that safe space because we never really know if we're suddenly going to be not taken seriously by someone who had taken us seriously before they knew we were gay. Right, right. And again, thank you for sharing that. We have some folks in the comments who can completely relate to that experience, myself included. Really, it's it's one of those things where I feel, and you said it best, um, the attuning yourself to the microaggressions, right? This kind of hypervigilance that you now have to add to your day. Um, it brings up a question about safety. Is this really a space in which in which we can do our best work? Um, and I want to make sure that we address some Q&A as well. And, and Jay, uh, Jace, let's get you a chance to kind of weigh in. Um, and then I want to get to some questions that have already come in because I love my attendees. You all know we love an uh, interactive panel. Jace, talk to me about what you're hearing um, and how this idea of safety and vulnerability comes into play, especially in your role with that fancy hat as a park ranger. I want to talk about that. Yeah. So, I mean, Gabrielle sees me nodding and that's because, I mean, not only do I see the comments of, yeah, that experience is echoed. Um, but I mean, each letter and each identity have their own shared experiences and each person has their own experiences um, unique to themselves in their workplaces. I mean, for me, it's been different in each workplace that I've been in. I've worked in very rural settings where I've been one of three employees in a, a town in which I dress differently for my own safety. Um, and I've been in places where I am on a staff of entirely queer people. Um, and those uh, experiences are widely different. And yet I am often the only one and often the first non-binary person in the space. Um, of course, non-binary experiences are widely different uh, amongst the community, but uh, one of the particular challenges there is uh, not having any understanding, kind of like what Gabrielle is saying of this sense of like taboo, just to disclose one's own identity. But people uh, who are operating from more of a cishet lens, or at least a cis lens, uh, as I often have my colleagues with those identities, just similarly have that experience, or I have the experience of seeing them squint, like being like, I don't really get it. Um, but on the flip side, I have had really powerful uh, supervisors, for example, who have deeply invested in me. Uh, I remember memorably one uh, supervisor had a training for the entire staff before I arrived on staff, um, just because I had I walked with identities that had not been in that space before and they wanted to be prepared uh, to show the respect necessary uh, to do right by me and empower me to do my best work. So uh, to have those allies who might walk with other marginalizations um, can be really, really powerful. Uh, and of course, when I'm in a public role, that is something that um, is, is top of mind because I, I mean, I have been followed home before uh, because uh, uh, the, the authority I walked with was threatening to people who are insecure with their own identities themselves. Right. <laughs> We're sorry to hear that. And I also think that that experience um, of, of having uh, an employer that shows, you mentioned respect, doing that training ahead of time, that really is about respect. And I want to just center everyone on that is the kind of theme at the core of this conversation, respect, dignity, safety, right? We're not talking about anything, I think, political on that aim. And I want to talk about allies because you mentioned having a, a, a manager, right, who brought in um, this training beforehand. And I think a lot of this is about how we as individuals, especially everyone on this call here, um, support the workplace, support the younger generation, but also everyone in the workplace. It requires us to make decisions as leaders, to be allies as managers. Let's talk about that. Um, let's get right into the idea that sometimes at work, you need people, other people, people especially who wield 
power, that, that precious resource of power in an organization to see you, to understand you, um, and to advocate on your behalf. Um, Andrew, I wonder if you could start us off uh, here and talk about some of the experience you've had with allies, but also the importance of those experiences. I mean, I know you were, uh, you and Matt, if Matt's still on the call, I want to give Matt a huge shout out. Andrew, please uh, take this opportunity to, you know, give Matt some love on air. Yeah, <laughs> so of course, I mean, as I alluded to earlier, I, I mentioned uh, just, just how lucky I feel to have uh, an outwardly supportive environment in my office. Um, I came to this this role and came involved with uh, Pride in Our Workplace in general uh, because of Matt McTighe, who is um, a partner here in the office. He was a mentor of mine through uh, the Mass LGBTQ Bar Association. And then, you know, after getting to know each other, we became colleagues. And I got to see from him what a career in this industry can look like, what it can look like being in the environment, um, in the industry as an out gay man, um, as someone who also is in a position of power and how people, the office and the larger firm respect him regardless. Uh, that's something I had not had seen before. Um, and that's, at least that's not something I'd seen in the legal industry is like, you know, wow, someone can be so open about who they are, but also have a position of power. And I think uh, on the one hand, that representation is very powerful. And on the other hand, uh, the investment that I feel um, from him and from other individuals, uh, truly looking out for someone um, who doesn't have um, the benefit of being in the majority, right? You know, understanding on a level, we go through different experiences, we face different challenges. Um, investing in me personally and professionally. Uh, that's, I think, very important because without that, um, I think it can be a very lonely and isolating experience where you feel unsupported, no matter how much you may love the work that you do. Um, so that's, I think mentors are largely very important um, in, in all workspaces, but especially so for those with marginalized identities. Right. And the idea of being lonely and being isolated, there's a the concept of the lonely only that we hear about with any minority, the only one in the room that looks a certain way. You inherently walk into that space with a, an unjust sense of power. And I think that's, Andrew, your experience reflects that of so many others. Um, the HRC found that the top reason that LGBTQ plus workers don't report like negative comments, many are like the butt of the joke or hear jokes about, you know, uh, LGBTQ plus communities um, is because the top reason they don't say anything is because they don't think anything would be done about it. And they don't want to hurt the relationship with coworkers. So not only do we have a lack of support at the outset, but even when situations arise, there's a lack of where to go and who to speak to um, in the workplace. An incredibly isolating experience. Um, Gabrielle, talk about coworkers, talk about your team um, and how you've experienced allyship. Yeah, I adore my team. We're a very small team. Everyone is really, really um, kind and very inclusive. And um, it was really interesting because when I told them I was going to be taking part in this panel, um, I just like nobody batted an eye and everyone was just like, okay, cool. Sounds fun. Like, good luck. So I thought just like the best case scenario, do you know what I mean? For it to not be a whole big thing, because I think that even like the other side of the coin from like a being like really weird and creepy um, or like dismissive or patronizing is someone being like overly performatively supportive, being like, oh my God a bisexual that's great you know what I mean like so it's just really nice to um experience allyship by just like being treated like a normal human by your colleagues and so that's like what allyship is right we're not asking for much <laughs> stay on that tell us what are what we are asking about and I think this is a question I want all of you to actually answer please is kind of when folks on the call here um are looking at the situation and going well how do I help those in my organization? What does it look like to be an ally? Gabrielle, are there examples you can share of, of how allyship has come out to, you know, in, in your role? Um, and again, Jace and Andrew, I would love uh, to, to lean on this for you as well. What does it look like to be an ally? What specifically are we talking about here? It's a big question. Yeah. So um, I guess in my, in my current role, like I said, I work, um, I write a lot about sexual wellness 
And um, a lot of it is like the articles will be titled something like best vibrators, best um, like various sex toys. And um, I'm really comfortable talking about this stuff, but I don't know how comfortable everyone else is. But um, once you go into the actual article, when I signed up to essentially write about take over the sexual wellness um, topic, I was like, I really want to take this opportunity to talk about consent and talk about um, like in, just to be inclusive and to talk about having like be communicating with partners and being safe. Um, and there was a lot of support from my team with that. My boss really stepped up and um, made it possible for me to not change my work. I don't want to ramble because I can go on about this for <laughs> years, but... <laughs> Not rambling. It's a, an amazing example of how you are pushing for what not only you as an individual, but the community at large that you kind of unwittingly represent, right, is in needs. And I think that that's the kind of shadow work Andrew talked about it, that layer of responsibility that sits on all of our heads as we enter these workspaces. It requires support. It requires help. Um, Jace, talk about this. Tell us about some allies in your world. Um, and again, this could also be what you hope people do. Maybe not what's happened to you, but we would love to hear any positive examples uh, of allies in the workplace. For sure. So, I mean, one that really is just so powerful to me is not only was the supervisor I, I previously mentioned able to, to require trainings in advance, but uh, because I think that training was issued um, and so proactively, I gained allies from that. I think if I had walked into the workplace before that had happened, um, it would have been different. And, and heck, I mean, I've been in workplaces where I've had to request those and it's a much different conversation even I'll say I've been in a position in which I really expected allyship uh, from someone who kind of shared some identities there, had offered understanding on a, on a kind of basic level, um, but then didn't show up with respect, um, validating uh, the, the kind of frustrations and discomforts that I was experiencing in a workplace. Um, I mean, one really powerful place for allyship for me um, and uh, that's been true across different work experiences, government and private sector is employee resource groups, like mm -hmm. a, a space designed uh, to share in solidarity um, and a place where from that I gain allyship is not just in the shared space of other people with queer identities, but other individuals involved in resource groups uh, because those are the people committed to uh, refocusing like DEI conversations from how can the work be done better to how can we empower people uh, to going back to what we were talking about earlier, be uh, comfortable bringing their authentic selves, even if not their full selves, but their authentic selves, where can they be comfortable performing from uh, to deliver uh, perspective that will so deeply enrich the workplace um, and, and therefore the productivity. So it's, I think, really short-sighted to say, for example, we don't have time for this training. It's like, no, you don't want to make time because you don't want to focus on how we can go a step below uh, to the real foundations of the workplace. And that's really important. Um, mm. So those, those spaces in which uh, I am sharing in place with people who all have that similar motivation of looking towards a workplace with a problem-solving mindset. Um, I mean, heck, I, I saw a question in the chat earlier of, of how can we engage in these conversations with people who are more conservative, see it more as mm -hmm. political, but there is so much data backing up how uh, enriching a workplace with a multitude of differing perspectives is more productive, is more effective, is better at delivering a good product um, and giving the infrastructure uh, to do so and investing in opportunities for people to meaningfully, meaningfully contribute to that process um, is critical. Right. And you mentioned allyship now on two levels, right? We talk about this as a mentor colleague level and then at an ERG level. Mm -hmm. I want to give a shout out to anyone on this call who has an employee resource group in place. Feel free to drop that in the chat. We do celebrate ERGs at PIOW. That's a lot of acronyms. We do celebrate your groups at this nonprofit um, and we support them because they're often uh, volunteer led, not paid, not given many resources, but often, as you describe, a very not only safe space to you know find others like yourself, but also to come to 
together in that kind of collective. And you mentioned infrastructure. That's what it is. It's a voice. It's a collective voice um, within the organization. And we've got some ERGs here, John and uh, Tenuti. I can't even pr pronounce your company name, but we support your ERG. Thank you. No, it's really, it's important. And I, you mentioned the question I want to get on this because it's important. The ERG, the allyship, that's one thing. Let's talk about that question that came in. Um, I am also in a conservative stuffy industry. This was in response to you, Andrew. What are tips to engage coworkers who might dismiss concerns or allyship as political? Jace, you've made a great point here that this isn't political. This, this is our lives. These are our people who are trying to give value to the organization. And yes, the data shows that it's profitable to be inclusive, but this is about respect. So Andrew, I want to give you a chance to jump in on that question about engaging folks that um, dismiss this whole conversation under the pejorative term of woke, or just this thing that doesn't need to be discussed as if it is not relevant to a conversation about work, whereas we all experience the intersection every day. So Andrew, how have you addressed that? Um, the, the, the colleagues who are just like, eh, eh, political. Right, and I, I want to first, um, I think, just first validate, um, you know, what you are saying, everyone, Jace, uh, Katie, and and this um, participant, that these are not just political questions. These are these are aspects of our identities that are central to who we are, that necessarily then come into the workplace because this is who we are, and I think that um, drawing from my experiences in in the past through in other, other workplaces and also um, as a student leader, it's, I think first and foremost, a question of comfort, right? I think I think you, I always try to prioritize uh, and check in with myself, do I feel comfortable and safe responding to this person in this moment? Because not every question needs or deserves an answer. They can be very um, intrusive and it can be, um, I think often wildly uncomfortable. So I think first and foremost, you know, don't feel like you owe anyone an answer um, explaining who you are to anyone. But also I think then from that point, if you do feel comfortable and you want this to be an ed educational moment, a teaching moment, I think engaging people in a way that kind of, um, I don't know, as, as a dialogue, um, I've found has been helpful in getting an open ear. I think for me, like the hardest part is getting someone to actually be in a place where they're ready and willing to listen to what I have to say. Uh, I think people may know or may not know that they're coming to a conversation with an expected answer in mind of like, oh, like, so what's this like? Or, you know, try to connect with you on a level that was just a wild microaggression in a way, you know, like, oh, yesterday I had like Chinese food at this place. Have you been? You know, it's kind of, I think first, which adds to the shadow work that we're discussing, like, then you have to kind of process like, okay, how do I engage in this person on a level that they're going to actually get something from this? Um, so I guess all that is to say, first, like, do you feel comfortable? And second, um, trying to think of how do you engage in a way that takes them out of a defensive place and into an open place? And I think touching upon allyship um, that we're discussing, that is something that I think is a huge step for allies to to really be effective allies, like be in a place where you are open to learning and listening to perspectives that are not your own, because only then can you then step into a more proactive role of uh, speaking out for someone who doesn't have the bandwidth to always be responding to, you know, questions and comments that are invalidating. Right. Right. And really good point there about first and foremost, um, checking the safety of the conversation and not taking it on as a requirement um, and really engaging with somebody I heard you say in a, in a listening mode. You know, that's really where the most productive conversation is going to happen. Nobody deserves having to be, you know, uh, in a situation where you're talking to someone who won't listen. We've all been there. Um, I think with, you know, uh, grassroots campaigning and kind of polit there's an idea that, you know, it's it's a it's a value based conversation. What do we have in common? Right. And, and use that shared ground to build upon as you discuss something that might unfortunately be um, something this person is not educated about, but is for you a very central part of how you move through the world. Um, Jace, Gabrielle, I want to give you both a chance to weigh in on this. Jace, let's start with you, please. Yeah, thank you, Katie. Um, so, Andrew, what you just said of you don't owe anyone an explanation is so powerful in this um, because I see how so often queer people, especially in my experience, non-binary people, 
are put in positions in which they are expected to explain and expected to educate. Um, and what's important in saying that is setting the foundation of expectation. And that's a really important thing in this work. Um, on one side, not expecting people to explain themselves and expecting that to come from a training or something like what um, might come from internal, like the organization itself, as opposed to the individual. So uh, removing that burden, reshifting the focus, reshifting the responsibility um, to where it actually belongs. If it's going to be a work in workplace setting, either you pay me to do the training or you pay someone else to do the training. But if it's going to be a training opportunity, that needs to happen. Um, and while I'm on that and, and in the like lens of how is this seen as political, I mean, to me, one thing that's really important is not just shifting the conversation in expectation for individuals, but also for the organization itself. One thing that uh, has really been striking to me uh, is not approaching it from this traditional like diversity and inclusion um, perspective of like, how can we ensure these individuals are meaningfully able to contribute to their workplace? That's kind of a deficit mentality. Um, instead, when we shift the burden of responsibility onto the organization to empower us, to allow us to show up, like realizing the, the restrictions in the workplace that are inherent to them are burdens on us as individuals and saying, how can the organization maximize our contributions and set a foundation for us to do so? Even in my own thinking, that's really changed the way that I respond to spaces where, and it's been regularly the case, even though I've worked in like progressive liberal spaces, um, I have also worked alongside people of very different political affiliations than me who uh, would vote for people who um, speak very uh, negatively of queer and trans lives. Um, and I was very pleasantly surprised, honestly, um, by the conversation I was able to have with a colleague who did not have understanding of my identity, was not really seeking that out. But when I said, like, you are saying things that limit how I am able to contribute in this space, like, can I offer you some perspective? Can we have a conversation about this? I am willing to do this work in this moment to ensure that you understand how I want to contribute and I want to be on the same page with you in my ability to contribute. I want respect in that. Um, and not just on a topic involving myself, but conveniently it was also around like, how do we show up for female colleagues? It was like a very visual uh, position. We we're at the desk and I noticed he was often stepping in to answer questions that had been asked of our female colleagues. And so to, have that conversation that was in part not just about me going back to what I was saying about ERGs like showing up in solidarity for others is really powerful um but to have that conversation and be like I I want to show up I know my colleagues want to show up I know you want to empower us to as well how can we be sure we all have the information that allows us um to look at each other with respect and agency so that we all can do our jobs effectively with each our own perspective in that. Right, right, and thank you. Um, in the chat, we have a call out, thank you for moving us away from deficit mentality. Jace, I just wonder if you could stay on that point real quick and um, explain that kind of idea of a deficit mentality, um, which I think is the opposite of a growth mindset, right? Tell me, tell it, help me and the rest of yeah. the- Yeah, yeah. So what I, what I mean by that in this space is like, DEI work, it's, it's not about tolerance, it's not about acceptance, it's about inclusion. And traditionally, I've seen it be about how can we get the right people in the room so that the photo looks good, right? Like, how do we tick those boxes so our statistics are favorable and demonstrate the sort of like checkpoints that the whatever board is setting out for us um, and that looks good on paper? No, it's not about like what looks good on paper. It's what, a, what people are able to contribute. And when uh, an organization looks uh, exclusively at their bottom line, it's all around how can the finances align uh, to justify this decision. Um, that to me is a little short-sighted when mm. uh, I would propose something more along the lines of how can we ensure that individuals are fully satisfied and not just satisfied, but able to contribute um, 
kind of more complicated feelings or have a space to express those, not to like vent, but to move through that process to see like, oh, there's a tension here. How can we problem solve? How can we troubleshoot it? How can we ensure that um, an organization, a space is empowering people? Um, stuff like training, stuff like DEI work, stuff like having lunch together every once in a while. Those things are just what looks uh, towards the opportunities for building solidarity um, that uh, I only see when a workplace top down is led by people who have the energy. Right, right. And the commitment and the investment and the true desire to make change um, at a level that goes beyond lip service. And Gabby, I want to bring your voice here about performative allyship um, and moves into actual policies, but also actual culture. How are those changes actually living out through the organization? Um, Gabby, I want to ask you about this because we chatted about this in the in the prep, but I'm somebody who as a marketer looks at performative allyship and the ways that companies pander to every social movement. So femvertising to rainbow washing in June to Black Lives Matter, you know, racial justice is washing. It's it's a really perva- pervasive issue in the marketing community, but it speaks to Jace what you mentioned here about organizations' instincts to want to show, you know, the right imagery, the right perception when it's behind the scenes, it's the work that, of allyship that, that truly matters. Um, Gabby, tell us about your thoughts again. And we're talking about this idea of, of workplace allyship and, and politicizing these conversations, but also tell me about your perspective on when it gets performative and the dangers of that. Yeah, so um, I, I wouldn't say that that's, it's as much applicable in my current workspace because like I said, my editors are unbelievably supportive. And if you read Marie Claire Magazine, which you all should, <laughs> it's uh, just absolutely wonderful and inclusive and um, really pushing the like envelope and bringing us forward. But um, when I worked in higher education and when I worked in um, sales, I would definitely say I experienced a bit of performative allyship. So um, when I was in higher education, I'll just like, Cliff Notes version, both of them. But when I was in higher education, I definitely felt like there was a lot of, I mean, you see like those, like those college pamphlets, right? That it's like a joke where, where there's like one white kid, there's like one black kid, someone's in a wheelchair. There's like, you know what I mean? Like somebody has like a really big rainbow flag on their backpack. Like, it's just like, they're trying to wait. There's like one of each and they're just trying to say like, look at us, like we're really progressive. We're really inclusive. This is what's cool now is being inclusive, come to our school. But then when I started working behind the scenes um, at my own alma mater, um, I wanted to, I was bringing these students abroad and it was through a Northeastern program where um, everybody, it goes abroad for like their very first semester of college. So oftentimes we get students who are, um, who are queer, who are non-binary, who are trans, who are coming out with their identities for the very first time in their lives. They think, they see these Northeastern pamphlets and they're like, this is obviously an inclusive space. I am going to go to this place. I'm going to feel safe. And now I was bringing these students abroad. And if you look at the statistics behind the rate at which non-binary and trans students are sexually assaulted or just straight up assaulted abroad in countries that are um, a little bit more um, behind in, in like their... Um, language about, um, I'm trying to find like a really um, good way of saying this, like that are a little bit more behind in like feminism and in in, Mm -hmm. like um, queer inclusivity than the United States necessarily is, um, where catcalling is a big thing, where people will call out your outfit if you're dressed in a um, in a way that's like, like non, um, like cis conforming, you know, if like a man wears nail polish. So um, I brought that up and I was like, we need to give these students resources. I, there is a huge dearth of resources on this and I'm not bringing, I'm not, I don't feel safe bringing like 30 like trans and non-binary students at least in this cohort of 75 kids or like hundred kids abroad and then not have like a, an action plan on ensuring that they stay safe and what to do if they're in an unsafe situation. And I made a whole deck on it. I, re- I did a ton of research and I actually found that it was really ill-received and there was a lot of, to the, the question that was put in the Q&A, I actually found that um, certain industries that try to be more woke and more performative on the outside are actually quite stuffy on the inside. And we'll talk in the same terms of like, I we've never heard these con- concerns before. This hasn't been brought to my attention. It's not profitable for us. And this is not a good use of time. And then you bring back the, I, I, this was, I, you know, I was very outspoken of like, what do you mean? It's not a good use of time. I'm here to ensure student safety. And you're telling me that student safety is not a good use of time. So sometimes it can be quite a bit of an uphill battle. I would say the way to navigate that is to see if you can find an ally within the space who can 
help you um, who's hopefully higher up, like a manager or someone who you think will just be a good listener who might not be on your side at the moment, but who will sit and listen to you and to always push the questions back on them, you know, mm-hmm. to say like, you know, 60, 70 years ago, like people, of, it was very, um, you know, you would have said the same thing about people of color, where this is not a good use of our time being inclusive towards people of color. So like, don't you think that this is just history repeating itself with a different population? And then it really gives people food for thought. Um, But I also happen to be a little bit um, uh, aggressive when it comes to these things. And I would, yeah, if someone's not aggressive, they want to stay a little bit more behind the scenes, I would say to find allies or listeners within the space with whom you can have a calm conversation in the hopes that they can bring it up to the administration. Right. And kudos to you for doing that, that advocacy work, that protective advocacy work. It, it, it's necessary. Uh, I think aggressive is one thing. I just think it is as necessary and bold. And unfortunately, the reality of what you would have to do with integrity in that situation, truly. Um, I think you brought up a really good point about context and about history and history repeating itself. Um, and we're seeing so many, and I, and I know we're, we're talking about the workplace, but in this political climate, what we're seeing right now is so much um, really harmful narratives. And you see this kind of history repeating itself. I was reading about Anita Bryant yesterday um, from Florida and, you know, it just the the kind of ways in which um, marginalized communities are inherently scapegoated for political gain. And we have to remember that our colleagues who might be consuming certain news channels or our colleagues who are, you know, following certain people on the internet, they're receiving some really harmful narratives about these identities and us. And I think what you're describing is kind of this pushback, this kind of trying to balance those perspectives, which right now are being used for political gain. And so are, people are dumping millions of dollars into campaigns to amplify really harmful narratives, especially around gender affirming care right now. We see a lot of it happening um, in regards to children. What is happening on the other side to correct those narratives or to affirm the experience, right? That's where this kind of uh, duty falls on, unfortunately, individuals. Jace, I want to bring up your point again about shifting the responsibility of who's responsible for that correction um, to the organizations. This is how we think about allyship. It's about looking at what the movements around us, and I mean the LGBTQ plus equality movement, are calling for. I think right now it's calling for all workplaces to understand their responsibility, your responsibility to be allies. We have to meet the need of the existing uh, narratives with something. We can't expect everyone to just Google it and do their own research. It's not realistic. I want to talk a bit about- Can I, can what I these, add something please, before, please, before we move on there? Because yep. it, with with what Gabrielle's saying there and, and what you're saying about bringing up the other issues um, relevant in the workplace. I mean, one thing that- I also want to name is that this is inherently political. Unfortunately, we we are in a current world where the the humanity of people like me is so denied that political leaders would wish me dead or to not exist in the first place, would uh, classify me as as mentally ill. which is different than the medicalization of transness. I'd just like to be clear there, but like really deny who I am fundamentally um, and deny opportunities for the infrastructure like bathrooms, like email addresses, like ERGs to be relevant. Because when I talk about deficit mentality, like that is the principle that I'm fighting against of it's not just to make the profit at any opportunity and every opportunity possible to extort people of that is to look for a different equation, how people can contribute to that meaningful growth and profit. Um, but when we consider like what, what is infrastructure that helps us through a process, like each thing that is necessary is inherently political. There is legislation fighting against in state houses across the country because those who seek to undermine us also understand that um, they can scapegoat us in that mm-hmm. process uh, to uh, exclude us intentionally, um, and and therefore it is it is political. Thank you for speaking truth to that because that is the un- uncomfortable truth. It's very unpalatable for a lot of people who are used to keeping politics out of the workplace. It's not a reality, again, when the fabric of society is wrapped around our experiences at work. 
Thank you for that. And also thank you for getting into some very tangible, you called it infrastructure, right? Very tangible things that workplaces can do as simple as bathrooms, as simple as email signatures. Um, Andrew and Gabrielle, I wondered if you wanted to jump in there at all about any opportunities you're seeing that organizations are stepping up. Maybe they're in a state that is um, not a great safe space with their laws or policies uh, around being part of this community, but in the workplace, they've set those kind of protections. You know, um, Have you seen that? Do you recommend any, or are there any that you wish you would see out there? And Jace, feel free to weigh in as well. So Gabrielle, Andrew, anything to add there? These kind of infrastructure opportunities, please. In terms of infrastructural opportunities, um, I think it's difficult when, it, when we're talking about something that really boils down to individuals behavior within the workplace and policing that behavior and ensuring that everybody's treated with respect. Um, and like, I think that Jace gets to a really good point in saying that this is inherently political. Um, you know, like I'm also like, I'm Latino and Middle Eastern. So there's within my lifetime between like, um, the politic like the politicization of like being Middle Eastern post 9-11 and then just like um like honestly like Donald Trump's like rhetoric about Latinos you know like people who would think that like the population that you're from whether it's from or the population that you're a part of whether it is being a person of color where it's be whether it's being of a certain gender or being of a certain sex like sexuality or sexual identity it is often political because there is there are political parties and groups of people out there whose very rhetoric is like, you know, is essentially just saying that you should not have rights and that you're not the same um, caliber of person that you're capable of less, you know, I mean, look at like the, look at how much it's been politicized that people there's, there's literally like entire groups of people out there who think that like black people should have fewer rights. You know, these, these are, these are very political conversations, but there, I think that an organization should put out, it is an organization's responsibility to create things like workshops and ERGs and education, even if it's like, as far as they know, an all white and all straight space, you know what I mean? Even if as far as they know, everyone in the workplace is safe, I think infrastructurally it's worth making sure that everybody has the education to make it a safe space. And if you know what, like being very clear as a company, but to like to say that, you know what, if you have these, in my opinion, like abhorrent <laughs> political beliefs and you really believe that, leave it at home. There are a lot of things when you go into work that you really should leave at home. Um, like, you know, you wouldn't talk to your coworkers the same way you would talk to your friends unless your coworkers like become your friends, but you should be behaving differently at work than you should behave at home. So if you have, you know, these beliefs that lead you to treat somebody who's queer or somebody who's of color differently within the workspace, leave those urges at home or else I'm sorry, you're just not fit to be in the workspace. You have to like get some stuff under control and learn how to like control your behavior before you step into the door of a workplace. And that sounds really harsh, but I mean, if, if you're going to go ahead and be harsh to people, yeah, Jace is like, no, it's like, if you're going to go ahead and be rude for absolutely no reason, or you're going to it, like, and I think that also like when we bring up politics, I feel like I sound all over the place, but I feel like if somebody um, is going to treat me lesser or bring up my um, my sexuality or my like ethnicities in a workspace in a way that I find disrespectful or patronizing, then I have absolutely every right to come at them with whatever um, response I come at them with. And if they find it unpleasant, it's their if they find that reaction unpleasant, it is their fault for bringing it up. They're the ones who started by being unprofessional. Um, I don't, I'm not saying it's like scream and cry at someone at work. I'm just right. saying like, if I tell them that's unprofessional, you need to check yourself. I have every right to do that. I didn't start it. So for sure, for sure. And Andrew Jays, anything to add or jump in on, on top of this? And Rebecca in the chat, thank you. There are times when politics and human rights intersect and there's just no getting away from that. So thank you. Yeah, uh, so, you know, so much... It's, it's so wonderful to hear all these these conversations, I think, um, coming from like a, a school space where these conversations are more just you're able to have them more often throughout the day. So love all of this. And I think a couple of points I kind of want to touch upon, one, one of which being, you know, the performative allyship, um, agreeing with what everyone's saying. But also, I think it's it's worth mentioning and reminding, I think a lot of us kind of already have this in mind, but always being considering of who is not even getting the attention um, that that results in performative allyship, because I think there's often, you know, who is not at the table always, right? Like, are if you're talking about queer people, are and you have this 
institution-led initiative, are you only featuring, you know, cisgendered white people um, in your narrative? Are you featuring only gay people, lesbians? Are you, do you have anyone that is not being talked about even performatively, right? And I don't think that performative allyship is impactful, but I think not even seeing yourself get to a level that deserves um, that, you know, society and institutions think deserve a mention is really harmful as well. And I think personally, uh, as someone that was leading um, an Asian American and Pacific Islander organization in school, looking around, um, there was obviously, there was a highlight of violence and racism towards Asian Americans specifically. And that was, that was really flooding my newsfeed while seeing no one in an in institutional space, you know, education, you think, People are always talking about things. There's always some something to to mention, and there was nothing there. That that is extremely harmful too, right? I think institutions, I guess, in terms of infrastructure, have someone checking, right? Like sometimes you look at things and you're like, who let this get out? You know, who who approved this? And then also, you know, who's not here because that has significant impacts. And I think when you're in spaces that don't have as robust robust infrastructure that are supporting um, marginalized groups, I, I think what you do have then can't just be like a a stepping stone of like look at what we have. Mm. What's actually happening in that space is really important. I think um, in ERGs and and affinity groups, as an example, okay, so there's this group. Are they meeting at all? Are they meeting regularly? Are people making connections from these groups? And who's in the space? I think if you don't have much infrastructure elsewhere, this is an easy thing to tout, but then something I've kind of thought about and have experienced is who is, who is in the space and who's the space for, right? Mm-hmm. Sometimes I need a space where I feel like the people here can relate to me on this shared affinity level. On way, in ways that other people can't. So if every meeting of that space is then like, oh, we're welcoming of everyone, but then there's someone who's not my affinity, like I honestly don't feel comfortable um, in a way that I was expecting to, right? Especially if there's someone that is power dynamics play into this as well. Like if there's someone like, oh, look, we had a really important person here in this space okay, but this really important person has some power over me, whether directly or indirectly, so can I even voice my concerns now? And that just makes it even, I think, a slap in the face to have this um, infrastructure that then you don't feel like you can even utilize. And I've had this happen in in school spaces uh, in in so many different spaces. So it's something I just wanted to mention. Um, Yeah. Yeah, and infrastructure that is performative performative itself, 100%. Who is not at this table? Who is not in this space? Those are the questions that help us uh, keep things from being performative. And there's so much misunderstood about this space. I mean, I give talks on it, right? It's People want to do the right thing. And there's a lack of kind of this tangible um, awareness. And, and talk, Jace, I want you to, to chime in on this because we've talked about this quite a bit. Um, give us more thoughts on infrastructure and uh, how that especially if, uh, affects reputation and maybe some failures that you've experienced. Yeah, so for me, uh, in across multiple experiences, uh, private and public sector, um, I have insisted on infrastructure changes. Um, and that has not been intentional every time, but I see a trend. <laughs> um, because having infrastructure, and by, by that I mean, for example, at the Boston Globe, I came in um, and insisted on there being gender neutral restrooms, restrooms that I could use. Before they instituted that, I was going to my friend's workplace, 17 stories above, every time I had to go to the bathroom, not to make a point, but because I felt uncomfortable. Um, it took six months of me working there to get the infrastructure of having uh, bathrooms that I felt comfortable using. And that entire insistence. Um, developed visibility not only for those needs, but more fundamental ones. I will say the way we accomplished that was not only through an employee resource group, but I'll say it, a union. Mm. Employee resource groups are great. That is how oftentimes things are able to be pushed to the side because it's only through that institutional leverage, unfortunately, sometimes uh, that the infrastructure can be gained. 
um, at the National Park Service, I've been really insistent on uh, emails, email addresses, not misnaming people. Uh, for whatever reason, the HR policy has been that the email needs to be the legal name of an individual. That justification quickly falls apart when you see how sis how people are able to have their nicknames as part of emails, a, a Jonathan's, a John, a um, John's, a Jack, whatever else, like people have that married names, legal names, it, it gets fuzzy mm -hmm. until it's about trans people and chosen names. And then it's like a hard policy, it must be legal name. Um, and that is really, really meaningful because it allows, um, with without an accurate email, we are exchanging, we are introducing ourselves to colleagues using names that represent violence, represent trauma. I would not use my email address until it was my name, because why am I going to introduce myself to someone else, period? Um, and the way we, we uh, access that is through insistence, because in that workplace, there is no legitimate uh, way for that visibility uh, to reach the powers that be until it is in the position of an ally. Um, and those are things that are really, really important for workplaces to meet because when they are not met, I mean, I will say the places where I have not had the infrastructure, had a really hard time gaining the infrastructure to just be on an equal playing field as my colleagues are coincidentally or not the places where myself and my colleagues also experienced a lot of sexual violence and sexual harassment. There are places where my colleagues experienced racism and did not have ways of representing that to superiors and having kind of redress for the violence that they were experiencing. Um, that is how the solidarity works. Like once you have advocacy happening on one level, you can have it happening on a lot of others without destabilizing the organization itself. Mm -hmm. um, and it is also, I think the, the success of an organization to be flexible in responding to those relatively fundamental needs. I mean, at the end of the day, changing email addresses is relatively accessible. I have no reason to believe that an email address actually needs to be someone's legal name. Maybe an official private profile needs to have right. an official legal name, but that's it. Right. And the places where uh, workplaces and supervisors are, are really uh, stubborn about saying, no, we don't have the energy for this. We don't have the time for this. Um, are the places where a toxic workplace culture seems to set in. Uh, because it ends up being a no workplace. It ends up being a, I don't have energy for this. And that is contagious. That is a failure that is seen inside the organization. And that is also seen outside of it by, um, by people who want to come in and, and have a work meeting, but don't feel safe using the restrooms and hold that in and rush the meeting before leaving. Mm -hmm. That's places that, um, have tensions with their their the people they're coordinating with because they see an email address using one name and it's a wrong one and that's just confusing like mm -hmm. it, it is a failure of the organization it fails the organization as well right thank you for making that point and what you're speaking to essentially is reputation you know each each workplace has and brings a reputation a lot of money is spent on improving the uh, the public reputation to attract and engage employees. Um, and so I have, unfortunately, one of our final questions for all of you, and I warned you, we would want more time together, but we're going to keep it on time today. I want to ask you about reputation. I want to ask you about, um, and I think the answer is a resounding yes, and we've heard that echoed, but how does that idea of the reputation of a place affect you as a as talent, as somebody who wants to go work there, um, how have you seen this addressed, you know, uh, as a trend among your peers, um, you know, how an organization responds to the needs of its employees, talk about its impact on talent acquisition. Um, Andrew, I know you mentioned wanting to jump in and Gabby, I'd love to hear your voice on this too. So Andrew, let's start with you, please. Yeah, I think that's, um, I mean, it's extremely important. Jay spoke so well to the impact on current employees, but mm -hmm. as someone who, you know, the legal field if you are entering into a big law firm, they are almost like a dime a dozen, right? And everyone's comparing what makes this one different from that one. And this is my personal experience without, you know, I haven't had experiences in other fields, but it is, um, I'm not sure how understood how much information can be found through detective work and that we are finding as someone who is going through the process and surrounded by people who are all going through the process at the same time, we can find so much information, you know, I think, you know, I can find out who is in your office, who is not in your office. That impacts, do I feel comfortable entering a space where 
I'm not going to be reflected, at least on the basic numbers level. And then also, um, you know, like when you don't have much information elsewhere to, to go off of besides like, oh, we're great. We have this great culture that then sits in someone's mind and makes a decision into like, I'm going to choose this place to go. Um, and also once you're somewhere else, once you hear that like, oh, this other place has these are more robust um, opportunities, like, oh, they this group, I'm part of this group, we meet like every month or so, I've connected with people from this group, and now we're going to like have a phone call or get a coffee or something like that, we're just going to connect, versus like, oh, I am, um, where I work, we sometimes have like a Zoom call, you know, I think that really sits on the mind of employees when it's like, okay, where should I go? Where do I feel valued? If if the work that I do is going to be one thing, I also need to know that I'm going to feel supported in other ways. Um, and that, that makes, I think, I've been seeing a huge shift towards emphasis on um, that culture in at least the millennial generation. Um, so I'm not sure how, how understood that is amongst like recruiters and um, industries, but I think it's widely important to at least know um, what other places are offering and what you bring to the table. And being a leader in that space, I think is huge because everyone knows, oh, this, this company did that. And you expect people to follow and then you don't expect other people to follow. And then when you're in the latter category of like, oh, you know, they're not going to do that. They're not going to offer this, you know, they don't offer even like a space for marginalized employees. Why would they offer mm-hmm. a treat or opportunities, paid opportunities to go and connect with other people? And that, that just weighs on the mind of all employees, I think. It's extremely important. Absolutely. And these, these red flags are visible and they're visible to people that are, again, looking for very basic safety and protection at work. Gabby, any final thoughts here? And I'm going to invite Andrew and Jace uh, after this to share your final thoughts as we do wrap up today. But Gabby, any thoughts on this idea of, uh, again, reputational, employee reputation, um, policies, culture, vibes, does that um, affect who you choose to work with when you're taking on brand partnerships as well? I mean, just like really like reputation wise with choosing brand partners, like I don't mess with Kat Von D because like, for those who don't know, she like dated like for years and years, it's like white supremacist. And then later was like, I didn't realize he was a Nazi, but like, how do you not know you're dating a Nazi? Right. But like, and she's like an anti-vaxxer and all kinds of things that uh, at Marie Claire were not huge on. And um, just like also like Dolce & Gabbana, I'm not super queer friendly, obviously, or like um, very like Within the queer community, it's it's very well known that they're not queer friendly. Shein as well, like I refuse to go to anything or, or um, shop from there or um, offer any options on Marie Claire to buy anything from Shein because they're like using child slaves, right? And are super unsustainable. So things like that on a really baseline level. But I also just to, as, as far as final thoughts, I actually wanted to use um, that time to like loop in the other question about intersectionality and like, mm identity being one of your identities being forced to be more salient than the other so right like I am you know I'm Middle Eastern I'm Puerto Rican I like grew up kind of like without a lot of money and so um, I'm queer and some with some companies I think that do a lot of performative allyship that's like gold mine you know what I mean they're like oh yes like she will be on all the brochures but um so that's not a great way to go about that but then I also think that um among certain teams, I can tell when people want one of my identities to be more salient than the other in order to improve that team's reputation or in order to improve that company's reputation. So for instance, I've been the only woman on my team before, not at Marie Claire, but I've been in the past the only woman on my team. And I've noticed that you'll constantly be asked questions like you as a woman, like I have a question about this, about you as a, um, like how, what's your experience like as a woman? And I think it can be a little uncomfortable at times to constantly being called out in a way that points out your differences instead of being allowed to just feel like a human on the team who is allowed to just like go to work and clock in and do their job and make friends hopefully and then go home um and then I think that also um like I I had one particular work experience elsewhere where um people were constantly honing in on the fact that I'm Latina and any time where you I wanted to like talk about my Middle Eastern identity or just um talk about being queer it was really pushed down because I wasn't queer enough because I'm femme presenting or I um they didn't need Middle Eastern people they needed more Latinas that's like what was like um 
like, I don't want to say like, uh, that was just what was popular. So it was in like need and vogue in the world at the time is talking about like what black and Latinx people are going through, not talking about necessarily what Arab people are going through. So I'd say that my advice and my final thoughts on that is to just never let people put you in a box. And if you're uncomfortable being like the post, like you're not required just because you're a minority to be like the poster child for like, um, for like whatever population you're part of. You can just go to work and like not hide your identity and let it come up when it comes up and talk about it. Like if all your coworkers are on the level where it's to it's okay to talk about your love lives. If someone's constantly saying like, oh, the man you marry, the man you marry, the man you marry, you're okay to say like, no, the person I marry, it might be a woman, it might be a non-binary person, I don't know. Um, to just like not let people tell you what you are and to like find small ways to bring all of your identities into conversations to the extent that you're comfortable. Right. Right. It's really brave, I have to say, all three of you, uh, to enter the workforce with this unapologetic sense of being yourself. I'm a millennial. Many on the call are older. Um, this is a generational shift, and it does take us to show up authentically one by one and share the stories that you've shared today to continue to make change. It is not easy. Um, we're on the on the top of the hour. So I want to invite my panelists to hang on with us for a few minutes. And if you're uh, able to still stay with us, I want to give each panelist a chance for final thoughts. Um, and as I put in the chat, if you have any questions that weren't addressed, info at PIOW.org. We can also um, get those to our panelists if you want to ask anything specific and have to jump. Um, but stay with us. And Jace, I want to get your final thoughts today. Um, again, this has been a, a wide ranging conversation, but so important. And thank you. Any final thoughts before we uh, let our delegates go? Yeah, thanks, Katie. Um, and thanks, Gabrielle and Andrew for, for joining me today, too, and every one of you uh, for tuning in. Um, Gabrielle, what you said at the, the top of the hour about patronizing, um, like kind of pandering, uh, is, is standing out to me as, as we conclude here. Uh, and especially as I talk about stuff like the infrastructure and the difference between workplaces that are interested in investing in that versus the ones who are not. I have been in a number of different workplaces um, in the last couple of years, uh, especially I've worked at uh, now four different national parks. Um, I've worked in the Senate, I've worked uh, in Boston Globe, I've worked in small nonprofits um, and big nonprofits as well. Um, and across all of those, the ones that um, are, are places that I could recommend to, to others uh, that I would want to go back to are the ones who really looked towards feedback as an opportunity, who looked towards um, a, a, a problem being brought up as an opportunity uh, to, to address that, to look forward, uh, to move forward, move through it together um, versus other play workplaces. Um, I have been explicitly told you speak to solidarity too much. I want you to be a team player, but with your manager, not your coworkers. And that's a red flag to me because that voices insecurity. Um, and it represents to me that there is not energy uh, to invest in looking forward. That is not only a deficit to the product, to whatever work we're trying to do, but also the individuals within it. And Andrew is totally right. That's something that all of us see. That is something that we witness um, as prospective employees looking at different choices. I mean, I am restricted a little bit more in my workplace. If I want to work at a national park, there's not another one across the river that I can work at as well. Um, but there are a variety of administrations of parks um, and of workplaces. Um, and there is a big difference when um, I see uh, interest, at least, because I say, oh, they're the right people involved. They're the right people making those decisions. I've seen that being pandered to. But honestly, once the cat is out of that bag, you run with it because that plants a seed. Uh, maybe it's not the management looking at stuff like an opportunity, but there are the right people in the right places. Um, and that builds uh, because otherwise, if, if you say no, then you're gonna go bust. <laughs> like, there's, mm -hmm. there's no other way around it uh, because if you're closed to opportunity, then uh, you're gonna fail. Right. And I, I thank you for framing. <laughs> we don't want that. No, our goal is to have everyone succeed here. I love this feedback as an opportunity, a uh, problem as an opportunity solidarity as a threat. These are fascinating perspectives that help us uh, understand, again, what an organization looks like that is safe versus not. And it does come down to workplace. Yeah. And um, I, I just want to say, because I, we're, we're amongst HR professionals here, DEI professionals, please, please, 
see those opportunities, soak in them, relish them, welcome them, savor the perspective that people can offer, say thank you, look people in the eye and say that hurts and that that sounds like it really hurt. How can we help? Uh, because uh, that is felt, that ripples, that echoes, and that changes uh, entire systems. I think it's a mic drop moment, Jace, honestly. And I want to invite- I want to leave with five. some feedback, some meaningful takeaways here, right? You've all given nothing but great sound bites and great meaningful takeaways. Trust me, our job to write a recap post and takeaways is going to be challenging. But Andrew, any final thoughts as we wrap up today? And again, I thank everyone to stay on a little bit later with us. This is so worth it. Yeah, I, I think um, all these perspectives are are so so enriching to me as well. So I'm appreciative of everyone for sharing them. But I think for me, what I think final thoughts are on the institutional level um, to to those that are in places of power that can at least influence some thought of like what can my company do. Um, you know, echoing what Jace just said. You know, I look at these opportunities and take them. And also, I don't know, think about what, what meaningful steps you can take instead of just what steps you can take, right? I think connecting with the people that you're trying to serve more in an authentic way rather than just like a, okay, like, hey, just, just you know, like we have this for you, you know, connecting in a way like what, what is it that would help you succeed in this environment? And then taking action on that is, is so important because it really does, like Jay says, Jay says, ripples through the culture of the environment individually. Um, it makes people feel welcome and, and better um, suited for the environment. But also, I think that's that's one thing. There's the ideal of having that supportive environment. But I'd also like to speak to when you don't have the environment you ideally would like, and how many of us have an ideal environment, right? Um, Unfortunately, first, understand what should not be on you, like, but also um, don't under, I think, try looking inside or outside of even where you're working for that individual connection. Who are the people that are your people? I think this goes through, you know, in life also, but just if you don't have that institutional support, like who are your people? Who can you talk to when you, you're like, that just, that just happened. I need someone there. And I think that is something that has carried me a very long way um, in my budding career, <laughs> but also something that I will be relying on. People I never expected to connect with that are in Boston, outside of Boston. Um, so I think that's that's what I'd like to leave with. Um, the two levels, institutional and personal, are both essential to a successful um, and happy career. Absolutely. And every single person that's joined us and stayed on this call are the type of people we see you um, invested in ensuring a safe, equitable, inclusive workplace. Thank you. Whether you're an ally, part of the community or somewhere in between, we love you. We see you and we thank you. I want to thank each of my panelists today. Um, PIOW is really about um, uh, bringing these perspectives together. I'm just going to put up a slide real quick with how you can get in touch with us. Um, if you haven't heard about the organization before, events like this is what it's all about, is bringing the perspectives of my three incredible panelists. What we're going to do is turn this into a best practices guide and continue to share your thoughts and amplify it. And that's the work that this organization does. Um, get in touch with us, follow us on all the socials, because our job is to make sure that we represent uh, folks like yourself and folks that do not have always a chance to voice their truths. Um, thank you to my panelists. Thank you to all of us for joining. Uh, and I see in the chat, people are having a wonderful experience. I totally agree. What a pleasure to moderate all of you. Good luck out there. Thank you to my panelists. A round of applause to each of you. Thank you for sharing your point of view and keep going because you are the future of the workplace. And if it's anything like what you've described, we are in great hands and uh, all of us at PIOW are here to continue to help. So thanks all of us for staying late. Thanks to my panelists and uh, take care out there. Thanks again, everyone.